From NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida, you're watching live coverage of the 15th SpaceX Cargo Resupply mission to the International Space Station. Hi, I'm Stephanie Martin and thanks for joining us. Today's launch to the station is scheduled for 542 Eastern this morning from Space Launch Complex 40 on Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. Today we have team coverage from Dan Hewitt at Station Mission Control in Houston, Tori McClendon and Mike Curie at NASA's Control Center, SpaceX's Mike Hammersley directly from their Mission Control in Hawthorne, California, and Amanda Griffin is standing by with several experts who have hardware and experiments aboard the Dragon. Today's launch will be SpaceX's 15th cargo resupply mission to the International Space Station and the second SpaceX resupply mission of the year. The Dragon spacecraft and Falcon 9 rocket will deliver about 5,900 pounds of research, crew supplies, and hardware to the orbiting laboratory. Today's launch window is instantaneous, meaning SpaceX has only a single second to launch off Space Launch Complex 40 at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station adjacent to NASA's Kennedy Space Center. We are now 26 minutes away from launch. Let's check in with NASA's Tori McClendon and Mike Curie. Thanks, Stephanie. I'm Tori McClendon, and with me is Mike Curie. Good morning, Tori. Good morning. Uh, we are looking forward to today's launch. We are one day removed from an official full moon, and uh, the time of launch is 44 minutes away from sunrise here on Florida's Space Coast. So I'm um, looking forward to a really probably spectacular view of the Falcon 9 and Dragon as they lift off the launch pad this morning. Sounds great. We're definitely looking forward to it. And we are actually here live at Hangar AE on Cape Canaveral Air Force Station, which is not far from the launch site of today's Falcon 9 rocket that will lift off from Space Launch Complex 40. That's right. And you're looking at a live shot of the launch site with the Falcon 9 rocket with uh, gaseous oxygen venting as the rocket is being prepared for launch at 542 and 42 seconds a.m. Eastern Time. As Stephanie was mentioning, it's an instantaneous launch window, so 42 seconds after 542 a.m. will be the uh, time of launch this morning. At that time, the International Space Station will be over the South Pacific, southeast of New Zealand, at an altitude of 258 statute miles. That's right, and the launch today would have the Dragon spacecraft that is filled with 5,900 pounds of research, crew supplies, and vehicle hardware being captured by the International Space Station on Monday, July 2nd at 7 a.m. Eastern. The Dragon will then connect to the station's Harmony module. Launch teams received a weather briefing from U.S. Air Force 45th Space Weather Squadron Officer Mike McAleenan. He's our launch weather officer. He says that we can expect uh, good weather today. Probability of violation is only 10%. That means we're 90% favorable. Uh, light winds, 8 to 10 miles per hour from the southwest. Temperature at the time of liftoff expected to be 76 degrees. The only concerns, the cumulus and anvil cloud rules. But again, uh, at this time, Mike McLean is saying that uh, we have thin and high cirrus clouds. Uh, there's really not much of a probability of anything happening between now and the time of launch, so it looks like weather is not going to be a concern for us today, Tori. Sounds great. Teams are also working through the necessary procedures to prepare the Falcon 9 rocket and the Dragon spacecraft for launch, and that includes loading fuel into both stages of the rocket and making sure that all systems are properly checking out. So far, the countdown has progressed toward the timeline. Loading of RP-1 fuel began at T minus one hour and 10 minutes at 4.32 a.m. Loading of liquid oxygen began at T minus 35 minutes at 5.07 a.m. So at T minus 23 minutes, 25 seconds and counting, that is the current status from Falcon Launch Control, Stephanie, and for now we'll send it back to you. Thanks, Tori and Mike. NASA is working with two American companies to deliver cargo to the International Space Station. Joining us now from Hawthorne, California, is SpaceX engineer Michael Hammersley. Michael, can you tell us a bit more about SpaceX? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks, Stephanie. Uh, we're really excited for today's launch. Uh, this will be SpaceX's 12th launch of 2018 and the third NASA commercial resupply mission to use both a flight-proven rocket and spacecraft. CRS-15 will also mark SpaceX's ninth flight-proven booster to fly this year and the 14th to date. Uh, that means SpaceX has actually flown more flight-proven rockets this year than new vehicles, and we expect that trend to continue into the future. 
Uh, Falcon 9's first stage for this mission previously supported the TESS mission in April of this year, uh, which makes it the quickest turnaround time for a flight-proven booster so far at, at, at two and a bit months. Uh, CRS-15's Dragon spacecraft previously supported the CRS-9 mission in July of 2016. Uh, both Falcon 9 and Dragon were designed with reflight in mind, so the vehicle hardware is built to support multiple missions with minimal refurbishment in between. For this mission, we've refurbished Dragon's heat shield and thermal protection system on Dragon's exterior. Uh, we also replaced the passive common berthing mechanism, uh, which is the ring on top of Dragon that connects to the International Space Station. Our Dragon spacecraft has been flying for six years now, and today it's the only vehicle flying that can deliver significant cargo both to and from the International Space Station. In 2010, SpaceX became the first private company to send a spacecraft to orbit and return it to Earth. Two years later, in 2012, Dragon became the first privately developed spacecraft to visit the International Space Station. Since then, we've made a total of 13 trips to the ISS, and we're under contract with NASA for a total of 26 cargo resupply missions. Uh, we're currently flying only cargo missions, but we'll soon fly humans to space as part of NASA's commercial crew program. SpaceX is upgrading its Dragon spacecraft to support human spaceflight with its first demonstration mission targeted for later this year. Uh, back to you, Stephanie. Thanks, Michael. Research conducted aboard the space station is helping to advance scientific knowledge across multiple disciplines, such as Earth, space, physical, and biological sciences. And all of these studies are designed to benefit us here on Earth. In fact, a new cancer treatment study is among the many research investigations launching today. Approximately 200 million people globally and 16 million in the U.S. are currently living with cancer. The Angiax Cancer Therapy Study aims to improve the understanding of endothelial cells that line the walls of blood vessels. Growing these cells in microgravity aboard the station could create an important model for evalu evaluating vascular targeted drugs like Angiax, which could target both tumor cells and tumor blood vessels with lower toxicity levels. The space station also serves as the world's leading laboratory where cutting edge research and technology continues to bring us closer to deep space exploration, meaning sending astronauts back to the moon and even to Mars. From robotic arms that grapple approaching spacecraft to artificial intelligence working alongside our crew members, robotics are an important aspect of li about living aboard the International Space Station. Our Amanda Griffin is joining us now with more. Thanks, Stephanie. And I can definitely say it's brighter in your studio than it is out here this morning, but that darkness should make for a beautiful launch. What's great about today is that we are seeing science fiction turn into reality. Many of our viewers may have heard of Robonaut, our RoboSapien, who recently spent time on the space station, but today we're sending a new crew member to space, and his name is Simon. Built for the German Aerospace Center, Simon stands for Crew Interactive Mobile Companion, and he will be the first flying autonomous astronaut assistant featuring artificial intelligence. The size of a medicine ball, Simon is able to see, hear, understand, and even interpret moods and feelings of the human crew. And another robotic element going up to station today is for the, the crew, um, for the robotic arm, for the Canada arm. With me today is Ken Podrowski from the Canadian Space Agency. So Ken, thanks for joining us. Good morning, Amanda. Can you tell us a little bit about this piece that's going up and what it does? So what we're gonna be flying on SpaceX 15 is the latching end effector. So the latching end effector, or the Lee, are basically the hands of the Canada arm too. So when SpaceX 15 arrives to space station on Monday, it's going to match speed with the in International Space Station. And then what we're going to do is the crew is going to reach out with the Canada Arm 2 using the latching end effector at its tip, and we're actually going to grapple that vehicle and then attach it to the space station. And can you guys grapple any vehicle? We can grapple all the vehicles that we're designed to do that, that we're d we were designed to do it with for. So today we do that for SpaceX. We also do that for the orbital vehicle, and we also do that for the Japanese H2 transfer vehicle as well. Okay, and. In the future, what other, are there vehicles in the future that you guys are going to be prepared for? Well, NASA is going to go ahead with its next uh, commercial contracts, which are going to include Sierra Nevada. So Sierra Nevada is going to be producing a new vehicle as well that's going to be flying to the International Space Station. So we're anticipating having to do free flyer captures of that vehicle as well with the Canada Arm 2. Right, and we've been studying these vehicles for quite some time, so why are we replacing it now? Well, we've gotten about 17 years of good operations out of Canada Arm 2, and it's been going very, very well. Last year, back in October, and then earlier this year in February, we actually took the steps to change out the hands on the Canada Arm 2. Okay. Uh, we had, we were 
watching performance, things were getting things were getting a little bit arthritic in terms of those hands, and they were starting to act up a little bit. So we made the decision to change them out. We've got two fully functional latching end effectors on the Canada Arm 2 now, so the arm is completely the arm and its hands are completely functional and operational now. The, the latching end effector that we're launching today is actually going to go up to be the new spare available in the space station. Oh, very good. And I understand there's another one coming back down. For That's right. Perfect. So the, the one, one of the ones that we changed out actually had a failed component in it, and we're actually going to be loading that inside the Dragon capsule. Dragon capsule is going to come back down to Earth, and then we're going to ship that hardware back to our prime contractor, MDA, in Ontario, Canada. They're going to refurbish that, and that'll be another subsequent spare that'll be available to keep the space robotics running on Space Station. Perfect. As everyone knows, in space you have to have redundancies in place, so we appreciate you guys sending that up for us today. Very welcome to do it. Thanks. Back to you, Stephanie. Thanks, Amanda. Among the teams supporting today's launch is NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston, which is home to mission control for the International Space Station. Joining us now is NASA's Dan Hewitt. Dan? Hey, Stephanie, and good morning, everybody, and welcome to Mission Control Houston. We're in the International Space Station Flight Control t uh, Room, where the Orbit One team is currently on console. They're led today by Mary Lawrence. They're supporting the crew on board the International Space Station, and they're also going to be watching along with today's launch. They're supporting the day-to-day -day operations here in this room, but they're also going to be working with flight controllers uh, from SpaceX out at Hawthorne once Dragon is in orbit and approaching the International Space Station. Uh, the crew on orbit right now is the crew of Expedition 56. It's a six-person contingent from countries all around the globe. Uh, they're led right now by astronaut Drew Feustel. You can see him live right here on the International Space Station. He's joined on board by NASA astronauts uh, Serena Anand-Chancellor and Ricky Arnold, two Russian cosmonauts Oleg Artemyev and Sergei Prokopiev, and then uh, German astronaut Alexander Gerst. Uh, once Dragon actually arrives at the International Space Station, it will be the crew that reaches out with the station's robotic arm and captures the vehicle as it hovers just about 30 feet away from the station. Ricky Arnold is going to be the prime, so he's going to be the one operating the robotic arm. And then Drew Feusel is going to be backing him up, providing any support and talking with the teams back down here on the ground. The crew's been training for this capture operation for the last couple of weeks, also getting all the systems on board the station ready to receive Dragon, because once it gets there, it becomes very, very busy for these crew members on board. Uh, not only capturing the vehicle, but once it gets attached and they get the hatch open, they go straight into executing a lot of that science that's on board and also unloading the thousands of pounds of stuff that Dragon is delivering to them. It'll be a very busy four weeks of science operations and cargo as they offload everything, execute the science, and then put it back on for Dragon to come home just a little under a month later. It'll actually also be the second uh, U.S. commercial cargo vehicle docked to the station, as right now there is a Northrop Grumman Cygnus vehicle still docked to the Earth-facing side of the Unity module. But for now, everybody here in Mission Control Houston going to follow along with the launch. Very excited to see a liftoff today and to see a Dragon arrive at the station in just a couple of days. For that, we'll head it over back to you at Kennedy, Stephanie. Everybody's real excited. Go Dragon. Thanks, Dan. At T minus 13 minutes and counting, let's go back to Tori and Mike in the Control Center for an update on how things are progressing. Thanks, Stephanie. As you just heard, we are at T minus 13 minutes and counting, and we're continuing to monitor today's launch countdown. Uh, the, the SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket stands poised to take off with a Dragon spacecraft uh, filled with science and supplies to the International Space Station. And as Dan Hewitt just said, the crew aboard the International Space Station awaits the arrival of Dragon. And meanwhile, teams here on Earth are working hard today to make that happen. Adjacent to NASA's Kennedy Space Center at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station, the SpaceX Launch Control Center team is working with its partners at SpaceX Mission Control in Hawthorne, California, and with the International Space Station Mission Control Center in Houston, Texas, to oversee today's launch of the Falcon 9 rocket. It truly is a team effort spanning the U.S. from the east to the west coast. It certainly is, and the U.S. Air Force also monitors the eastern range, or simply called the range, to make sure that commercial and personal aircraft are clear of the, any restricted areas and that the waters within the launch safety zone are clear of any boats. Each mission, the range reports any COLAs, which stands for Collision Avoidance with Objects in Space. So far, missions 
uh, excuse me, milestones that have already been performed include collision avoidance coordination with the Eastern Range, a checkout of the autonomous flight termination system, and the Eastern Range confirms that it is go for launch of the Falcon 9. That's right, Tori. And the 45th Space Wing also keeps an eye on the weather conditions. And Launch Weather Officer Mike McAleenan continues to hold a 90% chance of favorable weather for liftoff today at 5.42.42 a.m. The only possibility is uh, some clouds left over from thunderstorms last night. But at this point, it's not looking like they're going to present a problem for us. Well, we are keeping our fingers crossed, and we'll continue to monitor the launch countdown activities for SpaceX CRS-15, the flight to the International Space Station, which is the third SpaceX resupply mission for NASA, to use both a previously flown spacecraft and a booster. And with that, we will go back to you, Stephanie. Thanks, Tori and Mike. We would like to welcome those of you just joining us on NASA's social media platforms. I'm Stephanie Martin. The SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket and Dragon spacecraft are poised to lift off at 5.42 a.m. this morning. Today's launch will be an instantaneous launch window, meaning SpaceX has only a single second to launch. This will be SpaceX's second cargo resupply mission of the year. The Dragon spacecraft and Falcon 9 will deliver 5,900 pounds of crew, research, uh, supplies, and other hardware to the orbiting laboratory. The Dragon spacecraft launching on today's mission was previously flown on SpaceX's ninth cargo resupply mission, uh, and the Falcon 9 launched NASA's exoplanet Hunter spacecraft, known as TESS, earlier this year. Uh, so for now, let's go back to Amanda Griffin. She's standing out in the field. Thanks, Stephanie. So people are starting to gather out here. We can't wait for this uh, Falcon 9 to light up this early morning sky out here. And there are quite a few plant experiments going to space station today. And among them is space algae. Growing algae in space may help to recycle carbon dioxide while providing food for long duration missions. Many species of algae are rich in proteins and oils important for human nutrition. Antioxidants from algae may also help mitigate harmful effects of microgravity and cosmic radiation during space flight. While we want to understand how plants grow in space, we also know how plants here on Earth are responding to ever warming conditions. As Earth's climate changes, some regions are undergoing longer and more frequent droughts with more extreme conditions expected. By using the space station, EcoStress will give scientists early warnings about plant stress. Current satellite data on plant color shows regions where plants are so stressed that they've turned brown. By that time, plants are already dead and others are too stressed to save. EcoStress's temperature measurements will show where plants are still green and healthy, but struggling to stay cool and conserve water. The data could give agricultural water managers time to intervene with the right amount of water when it's most needed. Just another way we are working off the earth for the earth. And speaking of the importance of watering plants, so EcoStress is dealing with water here on earth, and I know I have with me Trent Smith. He's the veggie project manager. And I know watering plants in space and in microgravity is an issue. Oh, yeah. We're not going to get into that this morning, but I understand you have some special seeds on board. And can you tell me about those and maybe who helped you, you pick those? Sure thing. And uh, first of all, we have a wasabi mustard that we're going to send up. And I think the astronauts will like that spiciness. We have red Russian kale. And down in South Florida, we have a, uh, we've partnered with the Fairchild Tropical Botanic Garden. And we have more than 100 schools down there growing plants for science, for our NASA scientists. And they identified and tested dragoon lettuce and extra dwarf pak choy. Those did good well in the, uh, the school classroom. We tested them here, now they're on board Dragon. So I guess the, the mindset is if they could grow in a classroom, they could grow in space. Yeah, yeah, you know, the classroom can be a tough place, especially across all the different schools. And I think of it as a robustness index. I love it, citizen science. So apart from you know making sure that these plants can thrive, what other what other aspects are you looking for for plant yeah, choice? Yeah, yeah. So space plants really need to germinate well, grow quickly. They need to be compact because we have limited volume in veggie and APH. So uh, they need to grow fast and taste good. So speaking of tasting good, I understand <laughs> that astronauts like spicy things like that yep. wasabi mustard you're sending exactly. out. Exactly. Why is that? So in, gra in, in gravity, our hearts are uh, pumping the blood against gravity, and in microgravity, well, it doesn't happen, and so the fluid shifts to the head. And so if you've ever had a head cold, you know things might taste a little different. Sure. 
And so we think that astronauts will really like the spicy wasabi mustard because it does give you that horseradish wasabi flavor. Right, I bet. So what are the future plans for more citizen science like this? Yeah, so we have actually students in Ohio, Puerto Rico, and South Florida that are helping us. And we're going to meet with the Fairchild scientists and, and identify different questions that we have and develop experimental methods for the students to perform this next semester. I love it. The students get to be part of real NASA missions. Yeah. And do the astronauts get to actually eat the crops they chose? So these new crops, uh, we have uh, undergone the food safety testing. The results look good. We still got to go talk to the flight docs and the safety board, but I'm, I'm very hopeful. I'm I'm so excited for these kids that got to choose that. So Me thanks too. so much for engaging them and, yeah. and for veggie. My pleasure. Thanks. And back to you, Stephanie. Thanks, Amanda. At T minus six minutes, we're closing in on the final activities leading up to today's launch. Let's go back to the control room with Tori and Mike to follow the final countdown. Thanks, Stephanie. And yes, we are at T minus six minutes and counting. Welcome to those of you just joining us on social media. We are here at Hangar AE in Cape Canaveral Air Force Station, supporting the SpaceX CRS-15 launch of the Falcon 9 and the Dragon spacecraft that will deliver science and supplies to the International Space Station. For now, let's get you caught up to speed on today's launch countdown and what you can expect from here on out. Mike? Yes, Tori, the uh, Air Force Launch Weather Officer, Mike McAleenan, continues to give us a go forecast and current conditions, so weather is not a concern. The Air Force Eastern Range, or the range which is responsible for public safety during launches from here on the East Coast, has been coordinating with SpaceX and the NASA teams, ensuring that the launch area and the flight path are clear for the launch of the Falcon 9 rocket. Everything's looking good in that regard as well. The range starts at the launch pads at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station and Kennedy Space Center and extends eastward out over the Atlantic Ocean into the Indian Ocean. The range coordinator has verified that the range is go for launch. At T minus five minutes, the uh, range will complete communications checks. And then at T minus two minutes, the range control officer will verify that the Eastern Range is officially go for launch. And the Falcon 9 to, uh, flying today is a two-stage rocket. The first stage has nine engines named Merlin. The second stage has a single Merlin engine, which can operate in the vacuum of space. The engines are fueled by RP-1, which is a rocket-grade kerosene, and liquid oxygen. RP-1 fueling of both the Falcon 9 stages began on time at T minus one hour and 10 minutes. Liquid oxygen began flowing into both rocket stages as planned at T minus 35 minutes. And teams will begin setting up for final fuel at T minus seven minutes. We are now at T minus five minutes and counting, and about T minus 10, well, the launch director verified about T minus 10 minutes with the mission manager that the Dragon spacecraft was moved to internal power. That's right, and the Falcon 9 first stage engines were chilled down prior to a launch, and that occurred at T minus seven minutes. This uh, allows the engines to be cold enough to safely move the propellants or fuel through them. Shortly after that, the Falcon 9 began to move to internal power, and the system responsible for igniting the engines, TTEB, just before liftoff, uh, was pressurized at T minus six minutes. The strong back, which is the structure next to the Falcon 9, will begin to retract to its launch position at T minus four minutes and 50 seconds. The thrust vector control actuators will be moved or gimbaled, and this is the system which allows for the control of the vehicle while in flight that will occur at T minus two minutes and 55 seconds. We currently are at T minus four minutes and counting. At T minus one minute, the SpaceX Falcon 9 computer will begin its final pre-launch checks. And then at T minus 45 seconds, SpaceX Launch Director Mike Taylor will verify go for launch. And at liftoff, the Falcon 9 will produce 1.7 million pounds of thrust, which is greater than five 747s at full power. After liftoff, the Falcon 9 will begin a maneuver called a pitch kick at 10 seconds into flight. This move gets the rocket flying on its correct path. You can see that the strongback has retracted to its pre-launch position of 88.3 degrees. At one minute, five seconds after liftoff, the Falcon 9 will reach transonic speed and will pass through the area of maximum aerodynamic pressure, or max Q, at T minus, or at one minute, 18 seconds after liftoff. And at the time of launch today, the International Space Station will be over the South Pacific, southeast of New Zealand at an altitude of 258 statute miles. T minus three minutes and counting. And from now until liftoff, we'll be monitoring the countdown net, the primary circuit used by the SpaceX launch team during the terminal count. Daytona locks will close after flight. 
Weather remains go. The Strongback has reached its launch position of 88.3 degrees. Liquid oxygen venting from both first and second stages of the Falcon 9 rocket as it sits on the launch pad at Space Complex 40 on Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. T minus two minutes, 10 seconds and counting. Stage two launch to close out for flight. Stage two liquid oxygen closed out for flight, signifying a good liquid oxygen load. Next major milestone. T minus one minute, five seconds, the autonomous flight termination system will be checked and termed ready for Cat launch. Has started. One minute, 25 seconds. T minus one minute, 10 seconds and counting. Vehicles in startup. Falcon 9 is in startup mode. Flight computer is making its final pre launch checks. Propellant tanks are. Go for launch. Flight pressure, and as you hear, Launch Director Mike Taylor gives the go for launch of today's SpaceX CRS-15 mission. T-minus 30 seconds. Gas closeout's complete. The pad deluge water system will be activated at T-minus 18 seconds. Stage 1 tanks pressing for flight. T-minus 15 seconds. Everything is go. Ten, nine, T minus eight. eight seconds, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. We have ignition and liftoff. The Falcon 9 rocket powers the Dragon spacecraft toward the International Space Station, laden with new research for the multinational crew. Transonic speed. The vehicle will pass through the area of maximum aerodynamic pressure, or max Q, at one minute eighteen seconds after liftoff. This is the point. Power and telemetry nominal. When mechanical stress on the rocket reaches its peak, because of the rocket's velocity and resistance created by the Earth's atmosphere. One minute into flight. that the Falcon 9 is supersonic. As you can see the contrail as the rocket passes through maximum dynamic pressure. Vehicle has reached maximum dynamic pressure. Just over one minute left in the flight of the first stage of the Falcon 9. At around two minutes, 35 seconds into the flight, all nine engines will sequentially shut down and you'll hear the call Miko, which is main engine cutoff. And back engine two. The MVAC is the second stage Merlin 
vacuum engine. It's being chilled for its operation, which will uh, get underway in a little bit more than 30 seconds. Standing by for main engine cutoff. Miko. Stage separation confirmed. Miko and stage separation confirmed. The first stage of the Falcon 9 rocket, having done its job, falls away from the second stage. MVAC ignition. MVAC ignition. The Merlin vacuum engine has ignited. Stage 1 AFTS is saved. The MVAC engine and the second stage will burn for about six and a half minutes, bringing Dragon into low Earth orbit. The engine produces 210,000 pounds of thrust. The vehicle is on a nominal trajectory. Bermuda acquisition of signal. Coming up on four minutes into the flight of Falcon and Dragon. First stage falling away in the upper left portion of your picture. Second stage continues to burn with Dragon on its way to the International Space Station. Four minutes, 15 seconds remaining in this burn of the MVAC engine. Position at New Hampshire. Coming up on five minutes after launch, everything continues to go well. The first stage in the lower left uh, portion of your picture not returning to the launch site today. Safely being disposed of. Meanwhile, stage two continues to burn. Three minutes, five seconds remaining before SECO second stage engine cutoff. Six minutes after launch, propulsion officer says everything continues to look healthy on the Merlin vacuum engine. Two minutes, 20 seconds remaining in this burn. Two minutes remaining before SECO. Second stage engine doing its job, taking the Dragon spacecraft to its assigned Vehicle position in space. On a trajectory. Seven minutes, two seconds after launch, just under a minute and a half remaining in the burn. Falcon second stage 
remaining on the proper trajectory. Everything looks good. One minute remaining in the burn of the Falcon 9 second stage. Eight minutes after launch, everything continues to go well. Stage two is in terminal guidance. Stage two is in terminal guidance. Stage two, AFDS is saved. Autonomous flight termination system is safe. About 15 seconds away from a second stage engine cutoff. Engine shut down. Nominal orbit insertion. And as you hear, nominal orbit insertion. Acquisition of signal Newfoundland. Next major milestone will be the deploy of the Dragon spacecraft. Looking at the SpaceX Mission Control Center in Hawthorne, California, standing by for Dragon deploy in 13 seconds. And we have Dragon yeah, separation. Yeah. Dragon flying on its own. Confirmed separation. Confirmed separation as Dragon begins its journey toward the International Space Station. One minute away from the begin of a solar array deploy. This will ensure that the Dragon spacecraft is powered for its trip to the space station. This is just the beginning of a cor carefully choreographed series of Draco thruster firings to reach the space station, and all that activity will be managed and monitored here at the International Space Station Flight Control Room at Mission Control Center in Houston, Texas. You can see the uh, view in the right of the International Space Station crew. Standing by for solar array deploy of uh, on the Dragon spacecraft in about 10 seconds. Dragon CC on countdown. Dragon's propulsion system has successfully primed and all thrusters report ready for firing. Standing by for confirmation of solar array deploy. Dragon is deploying a solar arrays.
And as you can see, the solar arrays deploying on the Dragon spacecraft. This will provide power to Dragon as it uh, initiates its journey toward the International Space Station. Twelve and a half minutes after liftoff, everything uh, went very well. Dragon is where it belongs in space. The solar arrays locking into place. So as Dragon unfurls its solar arrays, the spacecraft will continue its journey to the International Space Station. Dragon will arrive at the station on Monday, July 2nd. NASA television coverage begins at 5.30 a.m. Eastern. What's this thing on New Hampshire? For Dragon rendezvous, grapple, and berthing to the station, capture is scheduled for approximately 7 a.m. Following at 9 a.m. Eastern is coverage of the installation to the station's Harmony module. NASA astronaut Ricky Arnold, backed by fellow as NASA astronaut Drew Foistel, will supervise the operation of the Canada Arm 2 robotic arm for Dragon's capture, while NASA astronaut Serena Anand Chancellor monitors the spacecraft systems. After Dragon capture, ground commands will be sent from Mission Control in Houston for the station's arm to rotate it and install it on the bottom of the station's Harmony module. 13 minutes, 45 seconds after launch, a successful launch and the deploy of the Dragon and its journey to the International Space Station well underway. That will wrap up our coverage from here in Falcon Launch Control, Stephanie, and for now we will send it back to you. Thank you both. Dragon's journey now continues as it approaches the International Space Station. For more on Dragon's course, let's go back to NASA's Dan Hewitt and Mission Control at Johnson Space Center. Dan? Hey Stephanie, and again, welcome back everybody. A successful launch, always great to see Dragon in orbit and now on its way to the International Space Station. As you heard, it's gonna start doing some thruster firing, so the engines on Dragon are actually gonna fire over the next several days, and it's gonna raise its orbit. It's only a little ways off the Earth now. Eventually, it's gonna be all the way up on the same level as the International Space Station, about 250 statute miles over the Earth's surface. After it executes these firings over the next couple of days, it'll get get into the station's neighborhood on Monday. And then the folks here in this room in Mission Control Houston will be working very closely with the teams out in Hawthorne, California, overseeing Dragon Systems as the two work to bring Dragon in on the final stretches. It's gonna go through a series of checkpoints on Monday morning before eventually arriving at what's known as the capture point which is about 30 feet away from the station. And as you heard Tori talk about the prime robotics operator for that day, uh, Ricky Arnold will control the robotic arm, reach out, grapple the Dragon spacecraft, and then hand it over to the teams back down here on the ground to actually get Dragon installed. And then it'll be time to open up the hatch. That usually coming sometimes a couple of hours later, but usually the day after, and then unloading all of that science. And just a reminder, we'll be doing that live coverage on Monday, July 2nd. We'll be starting at 5.30 a.m. Eastern time. Capture coming right around 7 a.m. Eastern, 6 a.m. Central here in Houston. And we'll break for a little bit, coming back on for the installation coverage. But for now, Dragon in orbit, a successful launch. It's on its way to the space station, and we can't wait for it to get there. So with that, I'll hand it over to you, Stephanie. Great morning, great Dragon in orbit. Thanks, Dan. This concludes our live coverage of the launch of Falcon 9, sending Dragon filled with 5,900 pounds of research and crew supplies to the International Space Station. For more information about the space station, please visit www.nasa.gov forward slash station. And for more information about this mission, please visit www.nasa.gov forward slash SpaceX. And don't forget to tune in to the post-launch news conference on NASA television at 8 a.m. this morning Eastern time. I'm Stephanie Martin. For them from the team here at Kennedy Space Center, we'd like to thank you for joining us. And we will now leave you with a replay of today's launch. Everything is go. And nine. T minus eight. eight seconds, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. We have ignition and liftoff. The Falcon 9 rocket powers the Dragon spacecraft toward the International Space Station, laden with new research for the multinational crew. There's no problem.
nominal. Eagle is pitching downrange. At one minute, five seconds after liftoff, Falcon 9 reaches transonic speed. The vehicle will pass through the area of maximum aerodynamic pressure, or max Q, at one minute, 18 seconds after liftoff. This is the point when mechanical stress on the rocket reaches its peak because of the rocket's velocity and resistance created by the Earth's atmosphere. One minute into flight. Vehicle is supersonic. Confirmation that the Falcon 9 is supersonic. As you can see the contrail, as the rocket passes through maximum dynamic pressure. 